Well, a very good uh, a warm welcome to all of you today, this evening, uh, for our annual Plunkett Lecture. My name is Tim Daniel and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of St Vincent's Private Hospital, Sydney. It's indeed my pleasure to welcome you all to hear, here today. In keeping with our mission, it's uh, my pleasure to read our acknowledgement to country, so I will start with that. We would like to acknowledge and honour our elders of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Those who have lived here and first walked this land and to their descendants who maintain the spiritual connections and traditions. We'd also like to pay our respects to the Aboriginal staff and health professionals who contribute to providing excellent care in our hospital. It is now my pleasure to introduce Associate Professor Dr Bernadette Tobin, our Director at the Plunkett Centre for Ethics. Bernadette. Tim, thank you very much. Um, at, towards the end of 2017, my colleague Steve Matthews, who's down the back there with his glasses on the top of his head, Steve, you can just wave. Steve won a very prestigious Australian Research Council um, research project, a three year project for, um, uh, for doing this work dementia moral agency and identity, respecting the vulnerable. So Steve got going and involved Dr. Philippa Byers, who's sitting there. Philippa, if you can wave to people. And um, it's been a pleasure to have Steve and Philippa working on that subject and just hearing a little bit around and about um, as to what they were doing, what questions they were raising. And one fine day, somebody mentioned the name of Julian Hughes, and I big noted myself by saying, I know him. They, Steve and Philippa, I think, uh, had more respect for me on that occasion than ever before. <laughs> So I said to them, I think we should be inviting Julian out here to give the annual Plunkett Lecture, and, um, and so Julian is here. Now, Julian Hughes is an honorary professor at the University of Bristol and a visiting professor at the Policy, Ethics and Life Sciences Research Centre at the University of Newcastle in the UK. Until recently, he was Professor of Old Age Psychiatry, the Old Age, I'll get this right. He was the Honorary Professor of the Philosophy of Aging at Newcastle and uh, Professor of Old Age Psychiatry at Bristol. Prior to this, he worked full time as a consultant in Old Age Psychiatry in the National Health Service in North Tyneside. Now, Julian studied philosophy, politics and economics as an undergraduate at Oxford and then he gained a PhD at the University of Warwick in philosophy. I asked Julian to tell me the name of his thesis. He said, I've forgotten its name, but it was, um, he said, he used a critique derived from the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein to explore models of thought that are used to understand dementia. Well, having completed medicine at Bristol, Julian then trained in general practice. He served in the RAF as a GP trainee and then as a psychiatrist, and he completed further training back at the NHS in Oxford. He's been elected to a number of um, very prestigious bodies, including the Royal College of Psychiatrists in 2011, and he's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh. Now, his writings and research focus mainly on philosophical and ethical issues raised in connection with ageing and dementia. He has a lot of articles and three single author books, Thinking Through Dementia, Alzheimer's and Other Dementias, and How We Think About Dementia. Julian's been an advisor to the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence 
assisting in the writing of their guidelines to do with dementia and interlife care. He's been appointed an expert advisor for that group's Centre for Clinical Practice, and he's still currently serving on a General Medical Council group, which is something called the Task and Finish Group. So if we run out of questions on dementia, we might ask them what they do on a group whose name is Task and Finish. <laughs> Um, he tells me we're producing new guidance on consent. Well, in 2017, Julian was appointed a member of the Nuffield Council on Bioethics. He served on its working party on dementia before that, and then he was appointed the Nuffield Council's deputy chair. He served on that until his term finished in January this year. He's still on a working party, working on the ethical issues in connection with global health emergencies. So, uh, I was about to say he's a Renaissance man, but I'm not quite finished. Julian also plays the first. He's an associate of the London College of Music, and as a medical student, he taught the flute at the Bristol Cathedral School, and he once made a dollar busking in Harvard Square. <laughs> So I think we can say Renaissance man. Julian, it's such a pleasure to welcome you and thank you very much for agreeing to come and um, deliver the 2019 annual Plunkett Lecture, the name of which is To Thine Own Self Be True, Reflections on Authenticity, Citizenship and Dementia. Thanks, very much. <coughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, I must first um, thank my hosts at uh, St. Vincent's and the Australian Catholic University for their tremendous hospitality in getting me here to give the annual Plunkett Lecture. In particular, I must thank Bernadette Tobin for all of her encouragement and for all the arrangements which she's kindly put in place throughout my visit. I'm also grateful to Bernadette for her introduction there is something a little uh, difficult about being so kindly introduced by someone who is so clearly so much more competent and clear thinking than one is. Because there's the possibility that the audience would prefer the person making the introduction to continue speaking <laughs> rather than hand over to the wooden and tedious fellow who follows. Anyway, it's a delight to be back uh, in Australia. I've been here a number of times both for uh, pleasure and for, and for work. It did cross my mind that perhaps I should have been in contact with the Australian government before coming, because I was here um, for Alzheimer's Australia on the 24th of June 2010, when the Prime Minister Kevin Rudd was ousted in favour of Julia Gillard. <laughs> Alzheimer's Australia kindly asked me back in 2013, and I was here on the 27th of June, when Julia Gillard was ousted in favour of <laughs> Kevin Rudd. I'm here for a few more days, so <laughs> good luck, Scott Morrison. <clears throat> but how dare anybody come uh, from Brexit Britain to suggest there could be a political crisis here, when in the UK we've had a political crisis now for years. If there were to be a change in the Australian government during my visit, it would be rather remarkable, uh, but I'm sure nothing to do with me, but of course, Boris Johnson, if he were here, would probably blame the European Union, which would be completely unfounded and silly. But saying completely unfounded and silly things doesn't seem, in the UK at least, nor in the USA, to be an impediment to power. <laughs> but uh, I'm really meant to be speaking about uh, dementia. In, in the end, what I'm saying will have some sort of political resonances, albeit not party political, uh, but I'll get there in stages. Uh, so first I'm going to give a little uh, background um, about our understanding of dementia. This will lead me to talk about citizenship and from there I shall move to authenticity and I'll present, albeit briefly, some qualitative data from research we carried out in the northeast of England prior to, prior to making some concluding remarks. 
Dementia is not a new phenomenon, although the use of the word dementia has had different meanings over the millennia. At the risk of upsetting medical historians, I'm going to point to Alzheimer's discoveries at the start of the 20th century as a turning point. Tangles and plaques were identified in the brain of Augusta D, a lady with early onset dementia, and the term Alzheimer's disease was coined. And then I'm going to ride roughshod over further historical developments to highlight the work of Sir Martin Roth, who, with colleagues Sir Bernard Tomlinson and Gary Blessed from Newcastle University in England, published in 1970 Observations on the Brains of Demented Old People in the Journal of Neurological Science. A few years later, in 1978, some of the same group, but now featuring Professors Elaine and Robert Perry, published in the British Medical Journal a paper entitled Correlation of Cholinergic Abnormalities with Senile Plaques and Mental Test Scores in Senile Dementia. These papers helped to confirm and establish modern understandings of the neuropathology of the dementias. More than that, the papers by the Perrys, the paper by the Perrys paved the way for the development of the cholinesterase inhibitors, which remain the mainstay of drug treatment for people with Alzheimer's disease. By the time I arrived in Newcastle in 1998, it was also recognised under the leadership of Professor Ian McKeith as the major centre for research on dementia with Lewy bodies. Of course, research in old age psychiatry and dementia has also been carried out in other centres around the world, including here in Australia, where there's been a strong tradition of world-leading research. But what I'm pointing towards is a deeply embedded biomedical understanding of dementia. There was, and still is, a strongly biomedical way to understand the different dementias in terms of brain pathology, genetics, and possible treatments. The progress in neuroimaging has greatly added to some of these understandings. Even psychosocial treatments are evaluated in accordance with scientific paradigms where double-blind, placebo-controlled trials are held up as the ACME. All of this biomedical research is to the good. Well, perhaps not all of it, but then lots of research that, that the world could probably do, but, sorry, but there's lots of research that the world could probably do without. It's just that you can't always tell what might be of benefit. You can't always tell what the effects of research will be. These days, there's always the infamous search for impact. This generally does not include the kindly manner in which a research participant has been treated by the researchers. Someone showing an interest in you, trying to help, treating you like a human being, all these things count. Similarly, a young researcher may acquire the habit of curiosity, may learn from the focus of a particular project to look at people in a certain way and take interest in facets of the person that might otherwise be overlooked. But these things might happen in a piece of research that changes very little, that hardly sees the light of day. A larger piece of work may claim great impact, but use the participants merely as means, offending Kant's categorical imperative to treat people as ends in themselves, and only instill in the junior researcher an awareness that you need sharp elbows to get to the front of the pack. And there is the worry that a rather scientific biomedical approach fosters attitudes that obscure the person from view and skew the focus of care towards a purely biomedical understanding. For instance, drugs tend to be seen as the solution to many problems. When the cholinesterase inhibitors, the drugs for Alzheimer's, first came on the market, they were understandably very expensive. There was an imperative to use them. But what we saw and still see is that they convey only a modest benefit. It matters less these days because they're now very cheap. But in those days, for the cost of the drugs, we could have employed another nurse or occupational therapist. Might the work of a dedicated nurse have been more beneficial than the administration of one of these drugs to, say, 20 people? I'm not aware of anyone ever trying to work this out. Similarly, for many years, we've seen the overuse of psychotropic tr drugs to treat behaviours that are challenging in dementia. For these sorts of reason, whilst acknowledging the benefits of biomedical research, it's good that a more psychosocial approach has emerged too. 
Undoubtedly, the biggest boost to this was the publication in 1997 of Tom Kitwood's seminal work, Dementia Reconsidered, The Person Comes First. This year, the second edition of the work, now called Dementia Reconsidered Revisited, The Person Still Comes First, has been edited by Professor Dawn Brooker with contemporary commentaries on Kitwood's original chapters. Kitwood's work ushered in what was called the new culture of dementia care. This was person-centered dementia care, where the person was to be understood broadly in the context of relationship and social being. Kitwood famously spoke of malignant social psychology, the ways in which those around the person can undermine his or her standing by strong depersonalizing tendencies, disempowerment, infantilization, labeling, stigmatization, ignoring, mockery, and so forth. Meanwhile, the idea of malignant social psychology has been developed by Professor Steve Sabat from Georgetown University in his own seminal work published in 2001, The Experience of Alzheimer's Disease, Life Through a Tangled Veil, where he talks of malignant positioning. In his contribution to the new edition of Kitwood's work, Sabat describes malignant positioning as entailing a focus primarily on a person's dysfunctional attributes that arise, in the case of people with dementia, due to brain injury res resulting from disease. Once this focus, Sabat continues, is established, there then follows the creation of storylines about those diagnosed that emphasize dysfunction even where it may not exist at all. The practical relevance of this work is easily apparent. If a person living with dementia is malignantly positioned, then when he becomes aggressive, it's readily conceived that his dementia has worsened, that there have been changes in his brain state that can be rectified by chemicals, perhaps. But at any event, it's not worth taking time to understand the person because the brain changes preclude it. But in the new culture of dementia care, person-centered care, attempts are made to understand the person instead. The mantra is that any behavior that we might find challenging is the consequence of unmet need. It's not the person's fault, it's that we, in the psychosocial environment, just do not understand what the unmet need is. And in truth, understanding that need may be very demanding and meeting it may be even more so. Say the need is to get out of an institution to see one's parents, but one's parents are dead. It will not be possible to meet the need directly. But once we understand that this is the need that we're not meeting, we're more likely to, de to develop other means to deal with the situation. Anticipation, comfort, uh, the use of pictures, reassurance, religious ceremonies, reminiscence, validation of emotions. All such means may help to prevent the behavior we find so challenging and will generally be better than giving drugs. So we need a biomedical approach, but also a psychosocial one. Person-centered care has come to epitomize this approach, but there are two points to make about it. First, conceptually, it's worth asking what it means to be a person. Secondly, it's not working. Kitchwood spoke about relationships and social being. His was a social constructionist view of personhood. But there are reasons to think in a way that allows a greater role for biology too. Pia Contos from Toronto in Canada talks of embodied selfhood and has written eloquently to demonstrate the salience of the body for our understanding of the person. I've written about the person as a situated embodied agent both to emphasize the importance of the body, using the idea from the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor that our understanding itself is embodied, and to stress that the person living with even advanced dementia has agentive wishes and preferences. But also, this characterization of personhood stresses that our embodiment and our agency are situated. It's their situatedness that, as part of a history or narrative, as part of a culture, as part of a moral and ethical system, as part of a whole social embedding, it's this situatedness that helps us to understand the person's embodied agency. I know what she wants because I share so much with her in terms of history, culture, memories, and so forth. 
But now note, and pushing on, one of the ways in which she is situated or embedded is as part of a polis. She's a citizen of a city-state. Let's leave that hanging for a second. The second point was that person-centred care is not working. Well, of course, there is good practice here and there. But who of us can say that everywhere we go, we see things greatly improve from what they were in the 1980s when Kitwood was developing his views? Malignant positioning and malignant social psychology are still to be found all over the world. Yet, worryingly, all over the world, we'll be told that person-centred care is the norm. Let me not labour the point. Here instead is Kate Swaffer, an Australian dementia activist who herself has been diagnosed with dementia, writing at the end of the new edition of Kitwood's book. She says, From my experience, I believe Kitwood's person-centred care has not generally been translated into practice and instead has mostly been a tick box in an organisation's paperwork. She goes on to say that self-advocates are demanding real change, And this, I think, is where citizenship can take its stance. I left hanging the thought that we are situated or embedded as citizens as members of a polis or city-state. Now, one of the things about person-centred care is that it relies on other people adopting a new attitude. Citizenship is, amongst other things, about people with dementia standing up themselves and demanding their rights. It's about people like Kate Swaffer in Australia speaking out. It's about people like Keith Oliver, who has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, but is an Alzheimer's Society ambassador in the UK, and also contributed to the new Kitchwood book. It's about people like Keith representing the views of people living with dementia at the United Nations to the committee overseeing compliance with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. People living with a diagnosis of dementia are active on committees, steering groups, boards. They write books and blogs, they speak at conferences, they advise researchers and so forth. In a commentary in the Kitwood book, Keith Oliver and Reinhard Gus, a psychologist, suggest the growing political engagement of people with dementia and their involvement in advisory and policy making groups was something beyond the imagination 20 years ago. Towards the end of the book, Professor Claire Sir, who is professor at Leeds Beckett University, but who used to be part of the Bradford Dementia Group, formed by Kitchwood, talks of going beyond Kitchwood's new culture of dementia care to what she terms an inclusive culture. In the inclusive culture, she says, people are treated as citizens with full rights. Citizenship, I'm arguing, is the new kid on the block when it comes to conceptualising dementia. Let's take a step back and ask what citizenship is. Well, it can be defined in practice and, uh, and, it, and it is often conceived in a narrow political sense. For instance, Richard Bellamy, writing his very short introduction to citizenship, states, citizenship is a condition of civic equality. It consists of membership of a political community where all citizens can determine the terms of social cooperation on an equal basis. This status not only secures equal rights to the enjoyment of the collective goods provided by the political association, but also involves equal duties to promote and sustain them, including the good of democratic citizenship itself. In other words, citizenship is to do with rights and duties and with voting. I'm sure there's much that we could say in connection with dementia and these themes. We we would wish to assert that people with dementia have rights. They also have duties but these have been exercised over a lifetime and we'd wish to specify the duties of a citizen. These might include the duty to contribute to the general good of the political community, but different citizens fulfil this duty in a variety of ways and more or less at different times of their lives. What are the duties of any old ageing citizen and in what ways might the duties of someone living with a diagnosis of of dementia differ? Without further ado, I'm simply going to assert that A, it seems to me that people with dementia are often more capable of fulfilling their civic uh, duties than people might think, and B, that a citizen with dementia should not be expected any more than anyone else to fulfill unjustifiable and unreasonable duties. 
Voting is a whole subject in itself. Some years ago, in 2010, I contributed to a British medical journal editorial on the issue of dementia and voting. I'm not going to get bogged down, it in, down in it here. Suffice to say that there are probably people who are being disenfranchised through not being registered, even though capable of voting, and there are probably people who vote, although incompetent. At the time of our editorial, we wrote, in Australia, where voting is compulsory, an elector may be removed from the electoral roll if a medical practitioner certifies that he or she is of unsound mind, incapable of understanding the nature and importance of voting. In practice, it is unclear who is being excluded and what rights of redress they might have. I'd be interested to know what the situation now is in Australia. I know it's an issue the Australian Law Reform Commission has considered in connection with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It's obviously complicated, partly because no one wishes to impose tests of the capacity to vote. How many Trump supporters, in comparison with Clinton supporters, would have passed the test, one wonders. And in any case, the nature of supported decision-making when it comes to voting would be complicated. And yet, when we talk about citizenship, we need not have such a narrow political uh, version of it in mind. More pertinent to people with dementia is the idea of social citizenship. In an important book entitled Broadening the Dementia Debate Towards Social Citizenship, Ruth Bartlett and Deborah O'Connor have defined social citizenship as a relationship, practice or status in which a person with dementia is entitled to experience freedom from discrimination and to have opportunities to grow and participate in life to the fullest extent possible. It involves justice, recognition of social positions and the upholding of personhood rights and a fluid degree of respons responsibility for shaping events at a personal and societal level. Political citizenship, one might say, involves voting rights and duties, whilst social citizenship involves rights, personhood and relationships. The issue of rights seems central. In an important paper published online in the journal Dementia in 2017, but in print this year, entitled Rights in Mind, Thinking Differently About Dementia and Disability, Tom Shakespeare, Hannah Zelig and Peter Mittler concluded that a relational model of dementia lays the basis for a human rights approach to the condition based on collaborative partnerships between people with dementia and people from other disability communities. The disability rights movement, which Tom Shakespeare has contributed to and critiqued over many years, presents a paradigm for dementia. Nothing about us without us has been their rallying cry, which has now been firmly adopted by people who live with a diagnosis of dementia. Shakespeare and his colleagues argue that it is vital to situate the individual experience of dementia in the broader social context. We also need to articulate a human rights perspective in which self-advocacy is core. We need to expand our ideas about social models and about human rights in order to incorporate the experience of all human beings, including people living with dementia. We are embarking on a project of cultural transformation. One of the central moves here is to see dementia as a disability. This seems entirely reasonable, given the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Dis Disabilities, which defines persons with disabilities as those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. In the Dementia Manifesto, published in February of this year, Toby Williamson and I, Toby is an independent health and social care consultant who worked for some time in the Mental Health Foundation in the UK. We set out a manifesto based on three principles, the second being that we should see dementia both as disease and as disability. This was to emphasise the rights of people living with dementia to all the usual benefits of citizenship, whilst also recognising its effects as a physical disease on people's lives. Concerning the duality between disease and disability, we contended, and I apologise for the long quote, that the duality should not involve choosing one or the other. 
Both themes are relevant to individuals and families affected by dementia, practitioners, services, policy makers, communities and society. Seeing dementia as disease can provide understanding and some amelioration of its effects in the here and now and may generate in the future uh, and may generate solutions in the future but still remains limited in what it offers to people currently affected by the condition. Viewing dementia as a disability has the potential to change current perceptions of dementia and people's lived experience of the condition by altering in a positive way how society responds to dementia, supported by legal frameworks requiring institutions and individuals to adapt, accommodate and include people with dementia as citizens like anyone else. But a disability model should not be used as an excuse to reduce efforts to understand the biomedical aspects of dementia or to continue to seek effective interventions. The values underpinning one theme must not be used to deny or marginalise the values of the other. So dementia is both disease and disability, but it's especially its status as a disability that helps to establish the claim on rights. I should perhaps add the clarification that we were not saying that dementia is a disease, which clearly it is not, at least for the mundane reason that dementia is not one thing but many, but also because it is, in any case, a semantic construct rather than possessing any form of unique essence. It's not a thing as such. And just in case anyone's interested, I should add that the other two principles in our manifesto were first that our views about dementia reflect our views about humanity. We said dementia is a unique touchstone for understanding disease and disability, self-identity, aspects of the human condition such as ageing and mortality, a person's place in society, and how we live together as people, families and communities. And thirdly, secondly being the point about disease and disability, inspired by the work of Professor Bill Fulford, we argued that values-based practice, placing values centre stage throughout the course of dementia, with attention to rights, provides a means to safeguard the rights and humanity of people with dementia. In a moving peroration with which we'd agree, Tom Shakespeare and his colleagues concluded their article on dementia and disability rights thus. As a society, if we can assimilate and acknowledge all that dementia implies and the diverse ways in which people with dementia want to live, then we will also have a more profound understanding of life and all that it entails, not just decay, loss, transience and difficulty, but also joy, love and friendship. The benefits will be felt not just by those living with dementia, but by people living with disability and indeed everyone. Well, I wish now to move from citizenship to authenticity, but you might wonder why I want to make this move. I think I can point to three reasons at least. First, I just like the notion of authenticity. I think it's a rich notion having more depth than, say, the much vaunted concept of autonomy. So however important the principle of respect for autonomy might be, when we're thinking about the agentive characteristics of citizens, my hunch is that authenticity is relevant. Secondly, there are good reasons to link, authent to link authenticity with ageing. I've written elsewhere about why I think the notion of authentic ageing might be a good one, and a better one than the very popular notions in the medical literature of successful or active ageing. I don't like those ideas because actually, according to the criteria for successful ageing, and partly because we can't always remain active, we're bound to fail if it's a requirement of good ageing that we should be successful. <laughs> Whereas we can be authentic with or without disabilities and illnesses, and even as we die. Dr. Hannah Lacool from the University of Utrecht has written, has written an excellent paper, Aging and the Ethics of Authenticity, in The Gerontologist, which was published in 2017, in which she presents compelling reasons to think that authenticity should be used in the socio-cultural narratives which surround aging. She says, authenticity discourse is argued to be capable of, on the one hand, acknowledging the positive potentials of growth and development that later life may harbour, while on the other, providing support for recognising and integrating the inevitable existential vulnerability and finitude that old age also confronts us with. <clears throat> 
So if we can plausibly link authenticity to ageing, it's a short step to make the link to dementia. And if citizenship is relevant to dementia, then it is to authenticity. And the third reason to make the link from citizenship to authenticity is that we find the notion of authenticity embedded in literature about citizenship in connection with dementia. I've recently had published in a journal called Maturitas a scoping review of the concepts of citizenship and authenticity in connection with dementia. There are relatively few papers about authenticity and dementia, whereas there are now numerous papers on citizenship and dementia. However, only a couple use both notions, and then only in a tangential manner. Nevertheless, it can plausibly be argued that many of the papers about citizenship and dementia make use of ideas that suggest authenticity. The plausibility of this claim comes from the work on authenticity of Professor Alessandro Ferrara, Professor of Political Philosophy at the University of Rome Tor Vergata, who in his, in my view, brilliant 1998 book, Reflective Authenticity, Rethinking the Project of Modernity, sets out four dimensions or characteristics of authenticity derived from the psychoanalytic tradition, namely coherence, vitality, and, sorry, coherence, vitality, depth, and maturity. It's absolutely impossible to convey the profound and nuanced thought that underpins these dimensions in a few words, but here are some of the ways in which Professor Ferrara characterizes matters. Coherence is the possibility of summing up the modifications undergone by an identity during the lifetime of its bearer in the form of a narrative. Vitality designates the experience of joyful empowerment, the immediate and joyful experience of the self as worthy of love and esteem, as genuine and spontaneous. Depth suggests self-knowledge or self-reflection as well as the capacity to be alone. Maturity is the capacity to maintain a certain congruence between our ideal self and the actual potentials of our real self. It's also to show an ironic acceptance of one's finitude. It was these four dimensions that were everywhere in evidence in the papers on citizenship and dementia that I scoped in my review. For instance, a number of studies pointed to the idea of narrative coherence. Professor Clive Baldwin's work from his base in St. Thomas University in Canada has stressed the importance of integrating narrative and citizenship to link the personal and the political. Ruth Bartlett, one of the authors of the important book on social citizenship I mentioned before, has written about how campaigning for social change can be energizing for citizens and for their sense of individual identity. Her paper suggests a sense of vitality that you can become the person you want to be. Pia Contos, whom I mentioned in connection with the idea of embodied selfhood, has more recently written with colleagues about relational citizenship and conveyed the dimensions of vitality, depth, and maturity. I'm not going to go into the relevant papers in any detail here, but suffice to say that in promoting the need for a sense of citizenship in dementia, they also promote the possibility that people living with this diagnosis can be true to themselves. And that, of course, is the nub of authenticity. So it seems plausible that talk of citizenship and dementia links with talk of authenticity and dementia. I now wish to focus on authenticity, but for the sake of intellectual honesty, it's worth noting that there is a possible argument that these two notions oppose each other. It may be that the ability to be authentic is impaired by the demands of citizenship, being a good citizen might pose a threat to the dimensions of authenticity. To be honest, this possibility does appear in the literature, but invariably it appears as a possible threat, but not as a reality. Where people with dementia are being, or being encouraged to be, good citizens, especially where this entails social citizenship, the result is invariably a display of narrative coherence, a sense of joyful vitality, psychological depth, and mature acceptance. The self is not swallowed up by citizenship. The Greek authentikos suggests the idea of being genuine. 
Recently, in Authenticity, the Cultural History of a Political Concept, Umbach and Humphrey from the University of Nottingham in the UK have pointed to the Greek roots auto, meaning self, and hentes, meaning doer, and they said, to be authentic is to identify with or claim ownership of a narrative of origins or a sense of original and unadulterated selfhood. More frequently, authenticity is summed up in the advice spoken by Polonius to his son Laertes in Hamlet. This above all, to thine own self be true. This does, however, cause some problems because the immediate question is what it might mean to be true to yourself, which itself depends on what you mean by the self. The tension I'm going to highlight is that between the inner self and the outer self. The story of authenticity usually starts with Jean-Jacques Rousseau, although it doesn't appear that he ever used the word. In his book On Being Authentic, Charles Gignon makes the point that all of the core assumptions built into the concept of authenticity are fully worked out in his, in Rousseau's work, in Rousseau's writings. There is distrust of society, the idea of an inner true self, nostalgia for the happy age when people were unencumbered by social expectations and able to turn inwards to the noble savage living the innocent life of a child. And to quote directly from Gignon, there is the idea that our access to the source of our being is achieved not by cognitive reflection, but by feeling. This last idea, but the others too, makes direct contact with themes in dementia, where authentic engagement might, might well rely on shared feelings rather than on cognitive skill. But the main point is that the self to which we need to refer is the inner self, the self separate and protected from the outer world of society with its tendency to corrupt us from the purer natural state. Jumping forwards to the existentialist philosophers of the early 20th century, but Kierkegaard before them too, the emphasis is on the inner voice of the self. Jacob Gollum, writing in his book In Search of Authenticity, From Kierkegaard to Camus, says, to be authentic means to invent one's own way and pattern of life. Thus, Jean-Pierre Jean-Paul Sartre writes, man is nothing else but that which he makes of himself. He is the sum of his actions. Writing of Rousseau and the existentialists in a 2009 chapter, Alessandro Ferrara states, authenticity becomes associated with an attitude of openness and receptiveness towards inner motives in the assessment of the moral worth of action. The point being that authenticity becomes the basis of moral deliberation, but, it's does, but it does so as self-realization. The self is something inner, and it's here that we'll find how to be true to ourselves. This is perhaps not the whole story for the existentialists, for whom the outer never loses its importance. Certainly in Martin Heidegger, inauthentic existence involves being lost in the they, disappearing into the crowd. But to be authentic means to engage with others, albeit in a deep sense, not just as objects, but at the level of solicitude. His notion of being in the world itself suggests the need to look outwards and not just to the subjective inner world. Meanwhile, we find Charles Gignon writing, what we call our authentic self, the self we access and express when we are being authentic, is at its deepest level something shaped and defined by society. He says that we need to see that we draw from and are answerable <coughs> to the shared historical commitments and ideals that make up our communal life world. The idea is that the self to be true to is a self that reflects the complexity and depth of the world and not just whatever it is that motivates me at the moment. In my view, this has been summed up best by Charles Taylor, the Canadian philosopher, in his wonderful book, The Ethics of Authenticity. To quote, otherwise put, I can define my identity only against the background of things that matter, but to bracket out history, nature, society, the demands of solidarity, everything but what I find in myself, would be to eliminate all candidates for what matters. Only if I exist in a world in which history, 
or the demands of nature, or the needs of my fellow human beings, or the duties of citizenship, or the call of God, or something else of this order matters crucially, can I define an identity for myself that is not trivial? Authenticity is not the enemy of demands from beyond the self. It presupposes such demands. And actually, it turns out that Shakespeare realised this when he was writing Hamlet, for the full Polonius quote goes as follows. This above all to thine own self be true, and it doth follow, as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. In other words, the reason for being true to yourself is in order to be true to others. The focus is not on my inner self, it's on the nature of my relationship with the world, which moreover is inherent. Having indulged myself in some of the literature around authenticity, I suppose there's a question about what this might have to do with dementia. Well, having accepted that there's a social conception of citizenship and that there can be a conception of authenticity embedded in our understanding of citizenship, it's at least interesting to note that one way to consider authenticity is as a social virtue. Moreover, the inner life of the person with dementia is manifest to us through gestures and behaviours. As the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein famously wrote, what goes on within also has meaning only in the stream of life. The outer and the inner are not two separate things in the person. They are both part of the person who is also part of a framing context. So to be true to yourself is to be true to every aspect of yourself, where what has meaning for you, what is important to you, if it's to avoid the triviality of which Charles Taylor spoke, must have the requisite worldly standing. It cannot be a simple whim. Moreover, what I also want to say is that people living with dementia, with a diagnosis of dementia, do have such world-involving concerns. There are things that are important to them as individuals and as social beings. We know this because they, people like Kate Swaffer and Keith Oliver, tell us we know it because people like Steve Sabat have recorded conversations with people with quite advanced cognitive impairment and demonstrated that they remain semiotic subjects, people who understand and convey meaning. We know it because there is copious research to demonstrate meaning-making by people with dementia. For example, some of the ethnographic work in care homes carried out by Pia Contos. And we know it through observation and from the description of families and friends. People living with a diagnosis of dementia live authentic lives. At least they can live authentic lives if the environment is supportive. In the final moments of this lecture, I want to illustrate all of this by reference to a pilot project, the Helix Arch Study, we carried out in the northeast of England, funded by the Wellcome Trust, where we put an artist into an aged care facility and recorded his interactions with the residents Residents who had dementia, families and staff were interviewed about these interactions. There was some, in, there was some evidence of institutionalisation where residents were not able to be true to themselves. For example, knitting is not allowed in the absence of care staff for health and safety reasons and meals are regimented. One resident, when asked what being a citizen meant, said, well, nothing now. When pushed, the resident replied, what does it mean being a citizen? It's gone. But, on the other hand, there was a story from a daughter of her mother showing authenticity. The staff were inclined to put residents into their pyjamas early in the evening. Here's what the daughter said. So I think one day, when they were trying to say, let's put you in your pyjamas, and she said, my son will be coming. He'll think I'm senile if I'm in my pyjamas. So she's been more forceful than I think, actually, she is just totally true to herself. Here's a resident asserting herself. No, I am what I am, and that's who I am. You have a bit more nerve to just do something if you want to. And a male resident, similarly. I'm a quiet man, and I don't express myself. Never again, never again. If I've got something to say that's important, I'll talk away. There was a particular man who had been a singer when he was younger, but this was something the staff had not known. Encouraged by the artist, he revealed his singing career and began to sing. One member of staff said, when he, I'm going to pretend he's called Bill, 
When he was on about that, he used to sing, and that singing is the first I've heard Bill sing, so that got me. Recall Professor Ferrara's dimensions of coherence, vitality, depth, and maturity. Narrative coherence and vitality emerge in the story of the singer. There's depth in the account of the resident who did not wish to be seen in her pyjamas early in the evening. And a number of residents spoke of death and dying, which was something of a shock to the staff, but showed that the residents had a sense of maturity and of the finitude of their lives. Asked about citizenship, one resident gave a straightforward political reply. To vote, of course, it's a right. You should, I mean, it was fought for. Voting was fought for and you should do it. Indeed, their observations could be quite astute. The artist asked, what do you think of President Trump? The resident replied, he's a funny man, he's rather odd though, and then added, I think he could be a bit dangerous. (laughs) Others showed a developed sense of social citizenship. The researcher asks, do you feel part of the community here? And the resident says, oh yes, you've got to, you've got to. The researcher asks, you've got to? And the resident says, you've got to make do and mend suggesting you have to make it work. The community was important to the residents. Another resident said, I just like to help people. That's my way of being a citizen. And I love, I, and I love to walk up that path, though, she meant a corridor, and go into the coffee room and have a bit of a chat. Before I conclude, let me quote from a speech made to Mr. John Hubert Plunkett, recorded in the... Freeman's Journal, printed in New South Wales on Saturday the 28th of June 1856 on the occasion of his retirement from the Office of Attorney General. When the contests of parties shall have passed away and the voice of friendship and calumny have been alike balanced by death and the grave has closed over the generations which now know us, there will be no name recorded by the pen of history in Australian annals with juster or more enduring praise than that which belongs to Mr. Attorney General Plunkett. I have to say that my recent experience is that the quality of speeches at the time of of retirement has greatly diminished. (laughs) But it's been a pleasure and privilege to present the annual Plunkett Lecture in honour of a great man and in the presence of such an attentive and I'm sure discerning audience. I've suggested that people living with dementia can and do exercise both social citizenship and the social virtue of authenticity. Citizenship and authenticity emanate from personhood and rely upon and reflect the embedding contexts that give a person's life meaning and purpose. But let me take you back to the first principle of the manifesto written by Toby and me. Because it seems to me that a really interesting thing here is the way in which dementia is a touchstone for understanding our humanity generally. We all wish to flourish as human beings, but we only do this with the help of others, others to make things possible, my flight here, for instance, others to provide support, food, clothing, entertainment and stimulation, others to provide health care, others to educate us, but also to cherish and love us. Social citizenship is about encouraging the right regard of the other. Authenticity is about being true to ourselves as we engage with the world by seeing what it is that makes us the people we are. And again, central to those concerns that define us as selves is a concern, Heidegger's solicitude perhaps, for the other as one like us. This is true for all of us, but it's also true for people with dementia. In some ways, it's more starkly revealed when we consider people living with dementia. Nevertheless, it's a lesson that we need to learn and relearn that at root, our lives tend to flourish in the context of good quality human engagement. Let me end with a reflection from a member of staff in the facility in which we undertook our research. She said, I think sometimes we just forget and need to be stripped back down to basics and you don't need anything apart from two people and two chairs. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, Julian, thank you very much indeed for such a lovely 
such a lovely romp through an enormous amount of medicine and psychiatry and philosophy and our reflections on our responsibilities towards people with dementia. It's just been terrific. So we have now about, um, we have some time for discussion. So who would like to kick us off? Yes. Thank you very much for a stimulating lecture today. You raised the issue about patient-centred care and it's a tick box on a checklist. Um, I probably would say yes, that that is my experience when I go uh, to visit either relatives or friends in um, uh, residential aged care facilities. But I suppose if we think about a values-based practice or we think about trying to treat people with dementia, accepting authenticity is the basis of that, how would we transform the way we deliver care in residential aged care facilities? What do you see would be transformed? Well, that's a very good question. <clears throat> and I'm going to, um, I'm probably going to duck the question uh, on, on the grounds that it's probably just too difficult to, uh, to answer. But also I think that there's something about the notion of authenticity that actually, so I've banged on about authenticity. Uh, but actually, it's quite difficult ever to say for sure that someone else is being authentic. And it's even difficult to say of yourself that you're being authentic. We kind of don't really know. So it's a sort of, it's a virtue to which we aspire. And sometimes perhaps we're more authentic than other times. So to come back to your, to your question, I mean, I think what it, what it requires is for everybody involved to be authentic. But then the question, of course, is, well, you know, what does that mean? And, uh, and so I've said lots of words about what philosophers have said that means, but how do we kind of, trans your question, in a way, is how do we transpose those into, in, into reality? Um, maybe the only way is the rather uh, slow way of um, doing things by experience and by teaching, by, uh, not, by, um, not by, as it were, tick boxes, not by sitting people down and giving them lists of things they've got to do, but by mirroring, by people seeing good practice. Now, I know that in my career, I've often, uh, well, you know, I've often seen bad practice, but I've often seen people who are just fantastic at engaging with people, at helping to settle them down and so forth, it helped, you know, and, and I remember distinctly at one point, I, I used to be a um, consultant for a unit which looked after people with really advanced dementia who all had behaviour that was challenging. And I remember being in the corridor and uh, a man came up to me and was talking to me. I couldn't really understand what he was saying and he was getting agitated. And then one of my nursing colleagues just came up and in a very skillful way just kind of distracted him and... and, and things settled. Um, so it's hard, to, it's hard to kind of legislate about that. It's hard to kind of put that down in guidance. But I mean, it does mean some very, you know, it does require very basic things, doesn't it? It requires listening to people, being attentive. Uh, in a way, it requires, um, I suppose, the old, the old distinction between doing to and being with. It requires more sort of being with. It requires that you're not so uh, task orientated and so on. I, I realise that all of these things I'm saying are inadequate answers to your question because it would be lovely if we could just say, oh, well, to be authentic, you should do the following six things. I could put them up on my uh, PowerPoint and we could go around the world teaching people the six things to do and uh, then everything would be hunky-dory. But sadly, I don't think it's like that. I think it's a kind of, it's a kind of deeper instinct, really. I mean, if we're calling authenticity a virtue, then it's a sort of inner disposition. I mean, it's an inner disposition with some kind of outer, uh, outer aspects to it too. Uh, but it's, it's something that, that we have to kind of learn, and we don't just learn by um, didactic 
teaching, I guess. Thank you very much. That was a very wonderful lecture. And thank, thank you for your books too, which I've read and enjoyed and got a lot out of. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just interested in what you perceive to be the tensions between truth-telling in dementia and authenticity. The tensions or the um, attributes of those. Even, for example, if someone mm. with dementia thinks that their <clears throat> husband is still alive and the person cares yes. or the family member yeah. um, agrees um, or disagrees or works in what way with that. Yeah. No, thank you very much. I think that's, that's a good question. You've, you've slightly thrown me because there's going to be a, a, a seminar about truth-telling and dementia in a day or two. So, so this requires me to remember what I'm going to say in a day or two. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so, yeah, let's, let's see. Um, so, I, so I think that is a, that is a sort of a, 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 a good uh, example. But I'm, I, in a way, I'm going to come back a little bit to the, the answer I've just given. Uh, because th those situations when, um, when someone is requiring, someone, a person with dementia, is requiring an honest answer, but it's just kind of too difficult for the person they're talking to to give them the honest answer, th those, those are difficult situations. And I suppose if we could be authentic at those moments, it would be helpful. But of course, that again depends on you know what what is it to be authentic. In in my view, um, but this is this is where we do get into some of the complexities of to do with truth telling and lying and what what all that means. But in, in my view, I don't think that professionals should be lying to people with dementia. I just don't think they should. And uh, and uh, but I think that you can still have a sort of an authentic response to the person. Because, for instance, it may be that the thing you should be doing is picking up the emotion behind the question and then working with that. So that might be an authentic response. So you haven't told a lie. You've acknowledged that you can see that the person is upset and you're going to do something about them feeling upset. Uh, so that's, I, I think that is a kind of better, more, you know, to me that feels more authentic than telling a sort of downright lie to someone. But there are people, of course, who disagree. People will also say uh, that, um, that, it's, that it's simply not possible sometimes to do that, that sometimes if a person, that sometimes you just have to lie to a person. And the archetypal uh, case that's trotted out is, is where somebody's died and you can't just keep on saying to the person, oh, your husband's dead, your husband's dead, because it's like a kind of grief reaction all the time. Well, I, I wonder about that. I, I won't uh, go into examples to the contrary that I've, that I've seen, but I have seen examples to the contrary. And um, it seems to me that, uh, that we're in danger of, as it were, not trusting the person with dementia, that we sort of feel that they're just kind of not up to it. And, uh, and we make excuses. We say... Well, it's just distressing for them. Now, there may be cases in the world where it is just so distressing for the person and there's nothing else to do other than lie. I don't know. But it may be that some of the uh, distress is our own distress, that we just find it very difficult to say to the person, actually, your husband's dead or your, your, your wife's dead or your parents are dead. We just find it so, sort of difficult, and so it's easier just to kind of say, oh, they'll be here at five o'clock, they'll come for tea or something and just hope that the person forgets. And I don't think that's a very authentic response. It's not a sort of genuine response, it seems to me. We should take them more seriously. Sorry for the long-winded answer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It was wonderful. Uh, would you say a little more about the, uh, your understanding of the inner self? I suppose I'm a bit, bit conceited and I'm a bit sceptical about uh, there isn't a real me inside me, that this is who I am. Yeah. So I suppose it's a name for motives and attitudes and beliefs and so on, but, but could you say a bit more about that? <coughs> what is this inner true self? Well, um, I, I hope I convey, well I may, I may not have conveyed that I, I, I'm not that taken by the idea of a, an inner self 
uh, either. And, um, and I, so I think, I, I hope that uh, somebody once told me that all... Oh, Yes, yeah, so, there, so there are definitely people who point to the inner self and they, they, they say that is what the, that, that's what authenticity is about, it's about self-realization and by that they mean, you know, whatever I'm thinking at the moment. So if I kind of feel that uh, I'll, I'll be more authentic if I started smoking dope, um, then I'll get out my dope and start smoking it and then I'll, be, I'll give you more authentic answers in a minute once I've smoked my uh, little bit of dope. My, uh, anyway. Um, but I don't, you know, I, I, I'm much more on the, on the side of um, Char Charles Taylor. But somebody once said to me that all good people are mildly left-wing and mildly Wittgensteinian. And um, so, uh, so I, hope that, I hope that, I'm, that I am those things. And so in a mildly Wittgensteinian way, I think I'd, I'd want to say that, you know, Wittgenstein doesn't deny the inner, does he? He doesn't, he doesn't say, oh, there's no such thing as... Uh, as a person kind of having the feeling of hope or remembering things or whatever. But what he does, but what he does uh, I think, do is he kind of breaks down the distinction between the inner and the outer and he says, so okay, you kind of feel something inside you. We all do that. When I'm thinking, it seems to be something that's going on in my head. But he's saying that it always connects with outer things in the world. So even, even if it's, so even if it, you know, so this gets us into the private language argument and so on, even if it's a kind of private thing that I'm thinking, nevertheless, I can't think it unless it would have some kind of public manifestation. Otherwise, it wouldn't have any meaning. And so I think that's where I would come from. I would want to say that, of course, as human beings, we do, you know, we, we seem inevitably talk, in, we inevitably we talk in these sort of Cartesian ways of an inner and an outer. Um, but actually, we're an amalgam of those things. And one of the inner sort of points to the outer. And sometimes the outer points to the inner. But we're both of those things. Okay. I was interested in how you linked um, narrative cohesion with narrative cohesion with um, authenticity, and it reminded me of some of the literature with um, this existential distress that uh, can occur when you have a, a loss of the sense of the self. And I wondered if you'd seen anything like that in dementia patients with the um, impending loss <coughs> of dementia uh, suddenly being realised by the patient if a process like that occurs? Well, um, I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want to kind of generalise or, or whatever, but I, I'm sure, well, I know that you're right that people can become very distressed because of what they're experiencing and because of their awareness of what they're experiencing and that can make them really quite agitated and so on. And I think that that, so that sort of existential distress can occur, uh, it can occur earlier in the condition but it can also occur quite late in the condition. And of course by then it may be difficult for them to verbalise what exactly is, is going on but it does seem to be that something about the kind of loss of control and the sort of feeling that things are going to be done to them uh, that are beyond their control um, just is very distressing and agitating for them. So I'm sure, uh, I'm sure that, uh, well, I know that I've kind of seen that sort of thing. Um, I'm the, uh, it would be interesting then to think more, I think, as you're suggesting about narrative coherence and, uh, and how that might be helpful under those circumstances. Um, I, I suppose it might be helpful if, um, if we were able to talk in a more honest way at an earlier phase with people who are starting to get dementia. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, on a, on a kind of simplistic level, there's, there's just advanced care planning and there's all the kind of problems of doing that early enough in the condition in a sort of practical way. Um, but some of the, but you know, it's difficult even to do that. So it's difficult, as you'll know, it's sort of difficult 
even to um, get people to uh, you know, write powers of attorney and, and so forth at an early enough point when they still have the capacity to do that. It's even more difficult to sit down and start to talk to them in a, in a slightly sort of deeper way about these kind of existentialist things, existentialist uh, feelings. Um, I mean, I think it was striking um, that uh, the, the artist who we put into the care home, a, a very nice American chap called Jordan Baseman, uh, he was quite struck by how many of the people he spoke to in the care home, and they all had cognitive impairment and dementia, um, how many of them talked about death and dying, um, and then how shocked the staff were. And actually, the staff were quite upset by that. Um, but Jordan said, well, it's the natural thing for them to talk about, really. Uh, and it's sort of amazing that nobody has talked about it. So, um, so I think your question points to a variety of things that we, all, you know, we need to think about and take more seriously. I'm not sure if I fully answered it, though. But <laughs> <clears throat> um, thanks, Julian. Um, for, for a number of years, I was uh, director of human resources at a very large aged care provider. I mean, we, we, we had a big philosophical commitment to person centered care. We spent a lot of time talking about, well, what does that really mean? It's kind of revolutionary and so on. Yeah. Um, We'd have these conversations about, well, if, if we really meant it though, we would do this and we would do that and we would do the other. But of course we can't because that takes more staff and that takes more money and we just yeah. can't afford it. Yeah. And there was a fair bit of truth to that. But the thing that was most striking about it all was within the context of that conversation, real life down in the facilities, there was a, a proportion of care workers and RNs who did actually do person-centred care face-to-face, one-on-one, regardless of the resourcing constraints. They actually did it. Yeah. And everyone knew it. The problem was you can't recruit for it. Yeah. Because, you know, you can't... It's, it's not the kind of thing that you know what it looks like in advance of seeing it actually happen. Yes. It's very hard to set up a kind of staffing model around that, really hard. I haven't seen it done, and we've got a Royal Commission into Ageing, and they're not talking about it. Um, they're talking about more money, which I think is just going to run. It, it, more money is good, but it's more of the same, just mm -hmm. like before, only more so. Mm -hmm. So. You know, it just comes back to the first question that was asked. I'm not quite sure how we do that, but it seems to get to something like individual character. Mm. And whether there are enough people in our society to meet that need is a further question, of course, but that's just my thought about that. It's a very difficult issue. Yeah, no, thank, thanks for that, Damien. I, 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 think, you're, I think you're absolutely right. It, it is something to do with... Uh, character and um, so whilst um, you know whilst you can go around care facilities and uh, and make critical comments about them, um, you can also be quite struck by and surprised when you suddenly come across somebody doing something kind of wonderful. And uh, but as as you say, you know if it were possible. Uh, just to recruit the wonderful people, then everybody would. But you, you can't always tell, and you couldn't. Uh, uh, you, you know, you, you couldn't always tell from, as it were. You know, I'm in danger of saying something um, that's not good here. But you couldn't kind of tell by just looking at the person. You might, you know, oneself might make a sort of judgment about somebody and decide that they look a little bit rough or something. You know, that the care worker seems a bit rough. But then the next minute you see that care worker, uh, I can think of somebody in a care home who um, uh, came into a, a, a room with me seeing a, a lady who was very severely ill with her dementia, sort of in bed. And she was then immediately kind of started doing the lady's hair. And I, there was no, I did then see this same care worker on other occasions. And there was no sense in which she was doing this to impress me. It was just, it was utter 
it was just immediate from her that she just immediately started saying very kind of loving things to this lady and making her look better and so and so forth. Uh, so you can't you know you can't tell by just looking you know equally you can find somebody who looks like a good upright citizen. It turns out they're you know they're abusing people. But uh, so. Yeah, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about the relationship between the Jewish Sure that off the top of my head I can come up with a with, with a better word. I, I mean, um, think words like integrity, or, you know, would might capture some of it, um, and there and there may be you know other words like that. But I'm not sure that there's a word which really captures exactly what we're talking about. Um, you told me that you'd met uh, Charles Taylor. <laughs> he was your colleague. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm, I'm tempted to um, try to remember a, a quote from him, again from The Ethics of Authenticity, where he says that we, sh we should actually be, you know, we should be having arguments about what authenticity means. So he, so, so maybe that's the response to you, that actually, okay, people are saying, people are giving it this other spin, but we need to kind of fight back against that and, and make them see that there's a kind of broader, better notion of authenticity. Uh, maybe that's all we can do. Um, yeah, thanks. Though. Well, thanks. I'm picking up on, on that idea. Um, I was interested in, in uh, what you were saying about authenticity and citizenship. And most of it seems to cluster around things that people do, agency driven things. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you, what, uh, I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say about authenticity, citizenship, and the, the loss of those capacities, um, what it is to be authentic, what it is to be a citizen, when you're not able to exercise that kind mm -hmm. of agency in monstrous ways. Well, um, there, that is going to occur, isn't it? Yeah. But I guess my response is um, uh, it's slightly kind of... Uh, bullish response and to say, well, actually, that's going to occur for all of us yeah. uh, at some point, isn't it? And um, so the reason for pushing the line that I'm pushing is because um, I don't want anybody to uh, see people with dementia as losing their agentive powers before they have. And I, and I want to take that, you know, quite a long way, really, so that even people who uh, are by now not responding, just lying in bed, that we still need to recognize that they may have some sort of um, some sort of agency that they may you know that they may still be able to communicate with us in some sort of a way. I'm partly thinking of the work of uh, a physician ethicist called Wim Deckers in the the Netherlands, who wrote a paper about um, people who, say, are pulling out nasogastro, nasogastric tubes and in severe dementia. And he was saying, so that's a kind of bodily movement. And you might, just, you might just think of it as just that, as just a kind of reflex, that they don't like things going up their nose or something. But he said, no, it's, it's, the body has kind of meaning in it. And so these bodily movements are also showing us something about this person. And we need to take them seriously. I'm, I'm not suggesting that, that you wouldn't agree with that. Um, but um, uh, so, so what I'm saying is that, you know, so there, there will, presumably, there would become a 
point at which even that person with really severe dementia who's pulling out tubes and stuff eventually stops doing all of that and is then just kind of lying there kind of doing nothing. But you see, I don't want to say that's any different from anybody else who's, who sort of goes into a coma or you know, has a major head injury or whatever. Um, I, I'm, my hope is that we would still kind of try to push as if they might still be authentic. Um, but at some point, you know, that would start to look ridiculous if the person's actually dying. But then I, you see, I, then I don't think that's any different from anybody else dying. I don't think I can say more than that, I'm afraid. Yeah, but thank you. Yeah. I just want to pick up what's just been discussed there. Okay, anyway, um, so uh, yeah, it's, it strikes me that there's there's a tension between the idea of person-centered care and um, the situation that a lot of people with advanced dementia find themselves in. Because if our model of personhood is very cognitive, very focused on rational capacities, and those yeah. are those are lost um, once once a person reaches that sort of advanced stage of dementia, uh, then um, you end up with this dilemma, like kind of you you either sort of you need to change your model of um, what personhood means, or um, or you, you you need to, um, I suppose, like you're left with this uh, situation which you don't think this this individual can express preferences that they can't communicate, and in that sense, um, uh, you don't really get that, I suppose, um, that aim that you would like to have, where uh, there is some kind of space in our model for um, this person still being included in our moral community, having citizenship, and so on. So. Um, uh, yeah, I, I would like to hear a bit more about the idea of like kind of bodily communication and um, how how kind of one can be more sensitive and um, interpret what appear to be sort of non-communicative actions in a communicative way. Um, so I think that might be a way to try and kind of sort of keep the idea of citizenship there when someone's lost their capacity for actual agency. Well, th thanks for the thanks for the question. I, I think in a sense. Um, you've already pointed to to the answer, and, I, and it does go back a little bit, I think, to the to the previous question, that um, that you you need people who are who are good at at that, who have that ability to, ability to pick up what bodily movements mean. And all I can say is that I you know I've met people who are good at that. I remember um, early on when I was. Um, looking after a, a home uh, for people with advanced dementia. And um, when we did our reviews, the, we would bring in the person with dementia with their family. And this man was pulling very funny faces. I had no idea, you know, I wasn't sure whether this meant he was in pain. Or, and um, I then raised the issue with the nurses and they said, no, no, that's, that's him showing that he's happy. And I had no way of sort of knowing that that was true, really. But I did trust the nurses and you know and the, and the family. Um, so you need that that good kind of sense. We've we've also once done a bit of work on pain itself, and um, and of course the best people for judging whether somebody was in pain were often the people who worked most closely with the person. So I don't. So I, again, I don't think there's a sort of um, a, a sort of easy answer in the sense that you can say, well, if they do this, they mean that. But I think the answer really is you need somebody who really knows the person and then they'll, then they'll know whether a slight grimace is a good thing or, or a bad thing. Part of the thing we saw in this research on pain was that there were no signs that were absolutely indicative of pain. So there were some people who grimaced and it turned out they had some pain. There were some people who grimaced and it turned out they didn't have pain. They were grimacing for some, for some other reason. Um, so, you, so you need that kind of, that kind of nous, really. Um, but I, I suppose also, a little bit like in my inadequate answer to the last question, um, I, I would also want to you know, push the notion of personhood and, uh, and encourage the view that actually you don't lose personhood even in severe dementia, uh, partly because even in very severe dementia, 
things still happen, sometimes surprisingly. People have lucid episodes where they suddenly say something that makes sense. Uh, people suddenly make a movement or do something or smile in response to something. And on a more sort of um, philosophical level, there is the sort of thought that if what it is to be a person is in some way to be situated, um, then some of your personhood can be held by other people and by their kind of reactions um, uh, and by the things that they do um, for you. Um, but that again requires that those other people around you do know you, do know you well. Um, which again comes back to some of the earlier comments about um, making sure that we've discussed matters with, you know, making sure that we really do know, know people well. And this, is, this comes back to some very sort of basic issues that actually uh, when studies have been done of judgments made by families compared to what people with dementia would have wanted, it turns out that often, you know, families are much more overprotective. People with dementia would like things to be much more kind of upfront and, and, and so on. Um, so, um, so it, you know, the whole, the whole thing is very difficult, partly because we're, we're disinclined to talk about things sufficiently with people. And, you know, it's not that I'm, I wouldn't want people to go away and think that, you know, that my view is that we shall, that we must, that there's some kind of ethical imperative to go away and all start talking about our deaths and what we want to happen and how we should do it and, and so on. There may be some sort of uh, Im imperative that we should think about these things and do certain sorts of things, so establish powers of attorney or, or whatever. Um, but it may be that it's, there is something sort of natural about not wanting to talk to your mother about, you know, some issue, what's going to happen when she's fecally incontinent or something. Um, it may be that that's just quite natural, but then when you're in the situation where there's fecal incontinence and something's got to be done about it, uh, it's a struggle, but it's a kind of, you know, the thing is to have the struggle in a good way, and you'll have it in a good way if you know the person as well as you can, as if you're compassionate and have integrity and all these other things. Thanks. Um, well, um, two lovely tantalising notions just at the very end. One being that our personhood is held in part at least by others. And then the other, I should never to say two, because if I say two, I'm <laughs> guaranteed to forget the second. Um, so I'll let it go. You all heard it now. Before we go out and have a, um, a drink and a light refreshment, which we warmly welcome you to do, um, there are a couple of people I want to thank. Of course, I want to start by thanking my colleague, Steve Matthews, who's over there, and Philippa Bars, who's down here, for, um, well, for um, the work we do together and they're being marvellous colleagues but we're all for the technical and practical help that they have given. I want to thank um, Nadine Mayola, marketing from ACU, who's come up from Melbourne to help us with it. that. She's been terrific. I can't now see her but uh, there she is at the door. Nadine, thank you very much. I want to uh, thank Deborah Stone, the communications person at Australian Catholic University, who's organised a host of um, media events for Julian, uh, primarily on the ABC. And um, that's just terrific for other Aussies to get to hear Julian. And there is already up on the web, I understand, a lovely discussion that Julian had yesterday with Miff Warhurst and um, Bertie Blackman, the daughter of the artist Charles Blackman. So that's a lovely... So thank you very much to Deborah and um, for arranging for this whole uh, talk tonight to be um, videoed for, and it'll be up on the um, Plunkett Centre website very soon and then for the ABC's Big Ideas program um, to put it to air pretty soon. So that's terrific. Deborah Stone, thank you. I want to thank Steen, the audiographer, and Rod, I've mentioned, the videographer. I want to thank Daniel Long from St Vincent's and Tim Daniel. But most of all, no, not quite, 
very much. I want to thank Pip Wilson, who's sitting with us here today. Pip joined us about this time last year, and within about a second of being coming the admin assistant at the Plunkett Centre, she had to organise last year's. And um, so she was at, I can't say she did it in her sleep this year, but she did it so beautifully. So Pip, thank you very much for looking after everything. And of course, Julian. Julian, what a lovely feast of um, ideas you have given us. And um, uh, so much discussion about the person and the self and authenticity. It would have been completely different had we heard what we heard tonight from someone who didn't come across to each of us as such an impressive and wonderful man. So Julian, so everybody, I ask you now to join me in thanking <laughs> Professor Julian Hughes.